Yeah. Ah, Emily Brown, this is crazy shit in real estate. Legit. This might be my favorite episode ever. So to all my previous guests, please don't get your feelings hurt, but you'll know why in a second. Maurice Philogene. Oh my gosh, y'all. He wants you to just try life on and just enjoy, just enjoy, be prepared to go back and listen to it three times. I already have because there's so much impact here. I can't wait to see you on the other side. Hello, Maurice Philogene. Hello. Okay. Now I don't want to butcher it. I, I might as well just say Miss Brown. I'll go Miss Brown. It's Lee Brown, but you're fine. Everybody calls me Lee Brown. That's just one word. But I've been wanting to say Philogene since I saw you on my schedule because I love that last name. <laughs> Philogene is absolutely correct. How are you doing, Miss Lee Brown? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm, I'm fantastically well on this Friday. But you weren't fantastically on Thursday? What's up with the qualifier? That's, that's fair. You know what? Uh, I always feel better when I know that I'm going to be by water and I'm going to be by water today. What kind of water? Beach or lake? Uh, middle. It's a, it's the Chesapeake Bay, which is in Maryland. So it's like an inlet to the Atlantic, but gonna I go have a in, infinity view. What's that? You're going to go eat some crabs. <laughs> you know, Maryland. Yeah. I mean, we're in blue crab season. This is a good season. It, it is a good season. It is a good season. Just going to go chill and have a beer by the water. I cannot wait, actually. So what kind of beer are you going to have? Are you a Mick Ultra lightweight? Are you like a Guinness man? So where do you fall? Nah, I'm, I am a Heineken guy. Oh. Every once in a very long time, that means when I have it, I really, really enjoy it. I don't drink it too much, but yeah. it's going to happen today. So that's going to make it a great Friday then because you get to have your way. It will. It will. Where are you today? I am in my office in Concord, North Carolina. All you can see is the clean part. The filthy part is right here. I love your accent is the best. I love it. It's my get out of jail free card. I love. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I bet. I bet. I bet. <laughs> Very good. So tell me about you. Steve said we should meet. And so if Steve <laughs> says we should meet, then I always have a question in the back of my mind because, you know, he's sus but I love him. Yeah. He's an interesting guy for sure. Um, he said the same thing about you too, by the way. Yeah, so I'm like, you. I'm in the, scare him a little bit. I know I'm in the real estate space too, but I think from a different perspective. Um, so I'm buying apartment complexes, raising money from investors, etc. So are but, you doing a class, B class, C class? What are you buying? It depends, typically B and C class, but now with what's happening with the market, we've moved up a little bit to B plus, A minus to just weather the storm mm -hmm. a, a bit more, right? With a stronger, uh, stronger income, stronger cash flow. So are you syndicating uh, those since they're a higher price point? We can still syndicate them. It just, you know, it's where you make money when you buy it, right? It just depends on the situation of what's going on with that complex. Why is it that most real estate people never figure that out? I mean, I ask them that when I'm training, like, when do you make money when you do real estate, buying or selling? And they're all like selling. I'm like, no, no, just what happens you, after you, you buy, buy it. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> it's how you buy it. But I think that comes with experience, right? Because once you've gone full cycle on a couple of things, then you're like, man, I got to tee this up way better when I when I buy these things up front. You mean once you go broke one time or twice? I mean, yes, we've all been there. Happen. If it never happens, you don't know how to recover either. That's true. That is true. That is true. So I guess maybe that was the connection. And then just a quick background is I was a 25 year IT executive or management consulting executive, 22 years in the military as a federal agent, and then 15 years as a street cop in DC. Oh my Did God. All at the same time. Hence this logo, Try Life On. There's a lot of ways sure to did. live life the way, the way that they want. I just found my own way. And then I'm a huge traveler. I've been to 100 countries over 300 times, and I'm doing real estate in the Mediterranean now, and uh, I'm just living. You're just living. Okay, so what branch of the military were you in when you're doing officer work? Air Force. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, we're Army and Marine Corps here in North Carolina, so Air Force is, you mean, yeah, we got Goldsboro, you got that one little Air Force. <laughs> Except y'all always call us when you need help, though. That's the thing. That's the funny part. I mean, a little bit, but mm -hmm. I mean, still, we got the 82nd Airborne and the 101st, and they're kind of hard to to hold up in history. I'll just mm -hmm. that out. Facts. You, you, you express facts. I can't deny that. <laughs> Especially North Carolina, man. That's Marine and Army all through and through. I think 
Yeah, we have Pope Air Force Base down there, but it's not. You do. That's up around Goldsboro. But you know what's hilarious is like the the um, movement to rename everything and erase history. They tried to rename Fort Bragg, and they're not a soul calling it anything except Fort Bragg. Not a soul. Fort Bra- Why was it? A, is it a bad name? Was it tied to Confederacy or something like that? Oh, see, because nobody actually is a super nerd. You have to be a super nerd to know it was named after General Braxton Bragg, who was a Confederate officer. Oh. But, People don't know anything about him, what he stood for, what he did or who he was. And so they had to change the name to erase something that nobody was aware of. But we kind of love it because all the all the people serving there still call it Fort Bragg. because It's, it's Bragg. Bragg. I, I mean, I only know it as Bragg. And I know, every, you know, a lot of people that have been through there. So what is it called now? Well, the official paperwork name is Fort Liberty. But if you go down there and look for Fort Liberty, you'll get what? Yeah, a Fort Bragg. Like, oh, OK, it's over here. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I mean, I don't, there's too much of that political stuff going around, like political correctness and stuff. Whether <laughs> there's a bad name or what have you, there's still historical context to people coming through there and what they knew it as was brag. Go learn. I mean, it's not yeah. hard. Just go read a book. Yeah. So, all right. So my my podcast is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And I think your podcast is far more high-minded than mine. Mine is, uh, we tell the stories about things that nobody expects in real estate because you don't see it on HGTV and you never hear about it from a traditional realtor who on Instagram is just saying how perfect everything is. So we talk about the different angles. And I really would love to talk about your move in multifamily because a lot of my audience is <coughs> in the investor space, whether they're novice investors are wildly experienced and we've covered a thousand different angles. And so what I'm curious about with you, Mm -hmm. and this will be kind of a loaded question, so you can answer it or not, but I can tell that you will. Okay. Did you use your pension streams because you were in fields of work that include pension streams? Did you use that as a safety net when you got into investing so that you weren't going to be completely exposed to the whims of an unknown market? My pension stream. So do you mean like my 401k or? Uh, I mean, like you were in the military long enough to have a military pension because you were. Oh, the I got you. OK, so so to be clear, I was. Yes, I was always in the military coming out of college, but I had the option of going guard reserve the year. The year I came out, 97. Man, that feels really long time ago now. It's OK, but, we're the same age, but I'm a bottle blonde and you're bald. So nobody. <laughs> knows, so. I might be blonde. You just don't know. Uh, the year I came out, they just let officers go guard reserve. I've always been a reservist, but I've done the equivalent of nine years of active duty. So it's been quite some time. So no, I never really had to rely on that. What I did for real estate was rely on my paychecks. I was systematically investing from age 23, buying condos in DC. I would store my paycheck, store my paycheck, store my paycheck. And as soon as I had enough money to go buy a condo, I would buy it. Then I would take the cash flow from that condo, assuming it made cash flow, and I would couple it with my paycheck and I would store again until I had enough to go buy the second one and the third one and the fourth one. And what happened from 2002 to 2015, I got up to 35 single family homes, a bunch of them appreciated. And instead of being stupid and going out and buying three Mercedes and a house, I used the equity to pay off the other ones. So I found myself with 18 paid off homes and 160 grand of cash flow, and did it all from paychecks, from the military, from Accenture, the company I was working for. And um, when I added being a street cop in 2008, that helped get there a bit faster. But that's that's how it all worked for me. But I've never tapped into pension or 401k or self-directed IRA or anything. I mean, you've built in all these different revenue streams so that you could make smarter decisions. And I think people yeah. overlook the reality of that how doable that is especially when you're younger i mean i i have a whole different set of opinions but i've told my son who's 16 i'm like you need to be in the national guard because at one weekend a month and two weeks in the summer by the time you are 37 you will have a revenue stream that's independent of your jobby job and then if you look at investment real estate that can build another stream too but it all goes back to the discipline that you had in not wasting your money on foolish things. And I'll, I will say one of my good friends, he is a leader in the space. His, his podcast is called House Then the Car. And it's all about the education of you've got to think about real estate before you think about this other stuff. And you literally just spit out something that he would love. So I'm probably going to have to introduce you to Donnell and Erica and let you get on their podcast too, just for the record. But let's yeah, talk yeah. about that discipline in a world of social media and in a world of 
it, basically bragging about stuff. How did you maintain that discipline to say, you know what, I can look further term than my peers are? Because I had a why. And I had a why and I found my why very early and it was by happenstance. Um, something happened when I was 15 years old that changed the trajectory of my life and will forever change the generational history of my family. My father, so I grew up in inner city Boston. I'm a Haitian immigrant kid. My father wisely sent me overseas to spend a month with an exchange student's family in France that had stayed with me the previous summer. We didn't have a lot of money, but he, he, he cobbled up enough money to get me over there. This is 1990. You take an inner city kid like me, who all I know is the streets of Boston, and you put me in France in a 1983 stick shift Range Rover driving around with a family for 30 days, it changed me. It changed me, Lee, because I saw that life was more than sneakers and clothes and girls and beepers at the time and food and, you know, all that crap. What, 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 I, what I got was French funerals, French castles, French girls, French wine, French food, French weed, French Boy Scouts, French everything. And then it just clicked. Life can feel different, emotionally different than what I was used to. And to do it and to access that feeling again, I needed time and I needed money to do that. No job was going to give me the feeling that that trip gave me. So the, the second thing that happened, so it was two things. That was the first catalytic thing for me. The second thing that happened was I found the book Personal Finance for Dummies when I was 21 years old. It had the phrase passive income in it. And then the two things meshed. Oh, I can make income without physically have having to be somewhere, which would in fact a house allow me to go have the same experiences that I had when I started traveling. In the yard. That's the Holy moment shit. where as a realtor, that you totally throw open your mouth a little so bit. Because why. you know the reason they use somebody about else income. is probably that I bought you my first didn't property follow in 2002. up enough. So what it appreciated are you up to do? You're very busy. That's what we have for you here. Check out followupgolf.com slash crazy. Where you'll get a 30-day free trial of the program that apartment that I was just living in appreciated 30 grand. I figured it out. You and I didn't have social media the best back then. Part is, so I didn't have a model to like, oh, I'm going to be like this guy or whatever. You know what I did? I went to the Fairfax County up Library. Because that that's all you would do your business back then. If they could just remember your name. Me and the Fairfax so County Library in Kingstown, Alexandria, Virginia were friends for weekends on 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 weekends
buy this ball or house and everyone's going to think you're the shit. And I became very aware that that, that wasn't it. Wasn't it. It was experiences. It was people. It was family. Um, it was when I got a little bit older, consistently keeping yourself in the beginner's mindset to keep learning new things, go to the top of one mountain, get the hell off of it, go to the bottom of another and do something different because there's so much out there to live. And we have just one life. There's 28,000 days in the average life. I have 10,300 and some change left. I'm very aware of it. So I'm not going to waste my time doing a lot of things. But um, yeah, it, that funeral, <laughs> it had a lot of impact. I don't really think about it like that, the way you said it. No one's ever asked me that question. But I was aware that we have a very finite amount of time on this planet. And that's why when I listed that resume or whatever, it, it's not extraordinary to me. Right. You it's didn't even hear yourself ordinary. say it. It was the... I think most people describing a 15 year old experience would have said the food and the landscape and the house and the car, yeah. and the girls, and maybe a funeral way down the list. But it was the very first thing out of your mouth, which was just really striking. But it also goes to demonstrate that you were probably wired a little different from the get go to be 15 <laughs> and absorb that story. Yeah. But the, the reality is like the, I, I just think we've lost the idea that life is precious and, if you look at how we've totally surface leveled everything now, what you're talking about is depth instead of surface. And that's also yeah. the, the materialism that's hitting <laughs> us is about surface. It's not about depth. And that's where the good stuff is. The good stuff is in being racked to the bone when somebody dies or laughing so hard, you can't even breathe. And we, I think we've numbed a lot of that out, but Yay. My, my dad's going to love this episode because <laughs> my dad was the one that took me to funerals from day one. So we've yeah. been going to funerals since we were little. And my dad always said, you go to the funeral home for the living and you go to the funeral for the dead. And so if you knew the living, you have to go to receiving. And if you knew the dead, you go to the funeral. But that was how I was trained all along. And so, of course, I've dragged my kids to funerals since they were really tiny. So to them, it's just a a thing that happens, it's sad, but you have to have something you can be happy about with that person and something that you can mourn about that person. And I just yeah. thought that we see both sides until you, something causes you to focus on it. I, we, 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 we don't, we're very surface level. And I just posted on LinkedIn this morning. I did this thing called Freedom Friday on LinkedIn. And I just, I, I posted a picture of me and Lieutenant Colonel John Ballinger. Jo I met John on LinkedIn and I said to everyone, LinkedIn is, LinkedIn is not life. Or no, nor is social media. It's just a window or it's a tool to live life intentionally. So when I met him, I'm like, this is someone I want to have a meaningful relationship. So I invested in it. I went to go see him. I was helping him with real estate stuff. And then he opened the doors for me and my nine-year-old to go see the presidential helicopter fleet because he's a Marine pilot. So now we are the best of friends. That's the spice of life is investing in meaningful relationships around the world. And you can do it with business. But for all the, you know, the real estate listeners who are on here, as much real estate as I have, 200 million plus at this point, which really means absolutely nothing, real estate is just a tool to live life well. I can have 2,000 of them, but some people just need two or three to generate the passive income that they need over the expenses that they have to live the life that they've always wanted to live. It's very, very difficult now with all this social media and people trying to chase an image and things of that nature. Um, I think we were kind of fortunate to not have it. Oh, when we, when we grew up, hundred percent. I'm glad that my youth was not documented on somebody else's <laughs> device because right. you're right. supposed to be stupid at some point. But I am going to tell you something you said wrong, and I'm going to shake the mom finger at you. Where you said uh -oh. your hundred million doesn't mean anything. I know what it means. It means that you can choose to take your nine year old to go see a marine yeah. fleet of helicopters. <laughs> And that's the, it's not just the experience you gave to him. It's the time you give to him because that when you're, when your kid is a grown up like us and he's looking back, he's going to say, I remember when my dad took me to go see these helicopters That's fair. You may or may not tie it to the real estate, but it goes back to what you said when you're chasing that freedom. So here's the last thing I got to ask you about, because you yeah. also dropped this phrase of entrepreneurial depression. Have you ever coached with Dan Sullivan at strategic coach? No, I know. I feel like I know the name, but no, I haven't. Yeah, he, he's coached more entrepreneurs than anybody else in the world. And he's written a bazillion books. He's based in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And 
he's 75 or 76 years old and he's got this book of how he's going to live to 156 because he's determined to double his lifespan. It's kind of entertaining, but the, I, the book that he wrote that changed my life was this one. It's the 80% approach where he talks about how entrepreneurs like perfection. Yep. So our chasing of perfection means we expect other people to live up to us and they can't because they're not us. But anyway, it's the kind of stuff he talks about. But he lives in that space of how we're wired as entrepreneurs. So talk to me about that entrepreneurial depression, what it is, how you identify it, and what you what what it's done to drive you further. Lee, I didn't know I had it at the time. And it's actually hard. I've talked about it on a couple of podcasts and got emotional about it. I, I can more control the emotion now. I just didn't know what was happening to me. I was so driven about not necessarily about being rich or being wealthy. What I was driven about was the ability to control or do what I want, where I want, how I want, when I want. And, and what I was saying about the $200 million real estate, I wasn't meaning that it's not a, it's not a accomplishment. It is. But there are people who can have their freedom with just five grand of passive income if they have okay. two grand of bills. And that might be two or three places. So people shouldn't compare. But when I was doing it, I was an executive, a full-time executive during the day for 25 years. Then I was a full-time street cop at night for 15 of those years. Then I was being a military reservist on the side, but because I was a federal agent, I was on duty all the time. It was kind of strange. Plus self-managing on the weekend. So uh, property as far north and south as 300 miles. So when the fellows were going out, I wasn't. When the family was doing things, I wasn't. And who that who the F would, would I be talking to at that time frame? I just tell it to you like this. Look, none of my friends back then who looked like me were doing what I was doing, or at least I couldn't find people. It wasn't as easy as we have it now on social media to link with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So I had no one to talk to about the fact that I was running out of money. No one to talk to about the fact that I had to go paint apartments. No one to talk to about the fact that I hadn't done anything social in months. I was depressed, like really depressed. And where it changed, I went on a military deployment in 2015 to Turkey and Africa for two years. I found my purpose when I was doing that deployment. It's a long story. But when I found that purpose and I came back, I realized that, that I needed to find like-minded people quickly. Here's how I found them. It, I went to a conference. I knew it would be in real estate. And it led to... From 2002 to 2015, I did $5 million in real estate by myself, 160 grand of passive income. I'm very proud of that because it broke my family's money blueprint. But in 2016, I met my current partners for the company I started called Quattro Capital and some other business partners. Okay, But in general, on the real estate side, uh, we did our first syndication of an apartment complex in 2018. We've done almost 30 stints. It's $200 million of real estate. But I have family. We're not, a, we're not a business who says, oh, we're operating as a family. We're a family who purports to operate as a business. Right. I have people that I can lean on and to do stuff with who are like-minded. They understand that real estate is just a tool for life. It's not life. I'm so grateful. I'm so fortunate. And the reason I'm even doing this big stuff, even having my financial freedom, because I have other goals now. I have goal, philanthropic goals where I... I need to write like six and seven figure checks. So that's why I'm still doing this stuff. I have a different why. But if people are on a path to go try life on, as I say, in their own way, and it has nothing to do with money, whatever you want to be in life, go do it. But please, 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 please surround yourself with like-minded people or people who've already done it or get a coach to collapse your time frame. Understand that it is mentally exhausting. Because the definition of success keeps getting purported on social media as 10,000 different things. Where do you go? It's nuts. But that's what I mean by entrepreneurial depression. I was stuck in the middle of it, just wasn't aware of it, wasn't sleeping well because I was working full time day, being a street cop at night. It was just a rough, rough road. I would never change it, but there's no way in hell I would ever go back to it. Ever. So when, when you get that deep in the hole, though, it's so hard to see your way out of it because... I Entrepreneurs yeah. will just keep doing it because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Are they going to do it the right way? I'll just keep powering through. I'm a thoroughbred. I can do this. So when you found the that future business family, how did you start that conversation? I mean, there's a 
there's and I guarantee right now somebody is watching and listening to this and they are yeah. clinging to your words like a life preserver because they're thinking, oh my gosh, he's saying what I'm feeling. But if they get into that environment, so they go to that conference and they land in front of people, yeah. what does it take to say, I got to find my people? That's I think there's a we haven't really talked about this, I think, in the coaching and investor and in the success space of the gap between the low and the high, how do you bridge it? If you've ever wondered why some realtors do more business than others, then you pay attention to them and do what they do. In fact, one of my favorite friends in real estate is Deborah Beagle. She's in the Nashville area. And she will tell you as managing broker of the Ashton Group that the agents who join her team on Follow Up Boss are getting an average of two homes under contract in the first 90 days. If you want to be like Miss Beagle, go to followupboss.com slash crazy. You'll be really glad you checked it out. And frankly, so will your clients because they'll get to use you and be amazed by your real estate awesomeness. Go to Follow Up Boss dot com slash crazy it's hard but i will tell you this i stopped thinking about myself i started focusing on other people and in 2000 and it's a, i don't want it to th- this was this was permeating through my life not only in a business perspective but also in a social perspective so when i say i found people i happen to mention the business family but there are other people that i found in policing in philanthropy even in the media space where i wanted to do different things but since this is a real estate topic I was just at a real estate conference. My mental radar was very open and aware that I was interested in working with people. My now partner, Erin Hudson, I adore the hell out of her, gets on stage at this real estate conference in Boston, ironically, since I'm from there, and says, I work with um, this organization down in Nicaragua and I build home for $5,000. Would anyone be interested in donating $5,000 to help me build a home? No one stood up. That must have been gut-wrenching for her. Immediately, I stood up and I'm like, hell yeah, I'll help. So I donated 5000 That one act created $55,000 in seven minutes because other people right. jumped up. You know the funny thing about that instance? Two of the people that jumped up in the audience are my business partners now. I didn't know them at the time. So Aaron calls me a year later and says, hey, Mo, can you sponsor a deal? Because I had some net worth from other business stuff that I had done. I'm like, yeah, I'll sponsor a deal. Me, Aaron, Chad, and Kim did that deal. It was a 36-unit apartment complex in Tennessee. We still own it. It was so good. It was so seamless. We said, let's stick together. So we stuck together. And here we are 200 million later, and we added one more person. The other three are family members. And that's how we all came together. It's not that I was specifically looking for those people. It's just that I recognized that I was around like-minded people when it came to life. Like, this is good. And then we all had complementary corporate skills, business skills, all that different parts of life. Uh, Single mom, uh, young guy, Chad's the young guy. I'm kind of the OG of the crew. It was just a beautiful thing. But it all stemmed from me not thinking about myself, going to a conference, trying to connect with like-minded people. And I donated money and the rest is history. We'll just call that a God moment because nothing happens by accident. Let's just, you know. (laughs) All of that will preach right there, but you know, it's a, it's, it's a different podcast too. So yeah, <laughs> you know what I, what I hear you say though, is that yeah. you didn't know you were looking for your tribe. You didn't know they were looking for their tribe and you stood up anyway. And then suddenly your tribe appeared. And I think that's something that's going to be more and more visible as the world gets more and more, you know, I mean, this, this fake homogeneity that's going on right now. But when somebody stands up, somebody else says, Oh, Oh, I, I can do him. that. I see him. He's my people. He must be my people because he's standing up. They don't know all of your background. They don't know your principles and your beliefs and your value system, but you stood up. And so that's enough. Yeah. It, was, it, it, it was enough. And the other thing I'll say, my radar was available. You know, that, that phenomenon, law of attraction, the reticular activating system in your brain. You and I have not seen a light blue Honda Accord today, but just because we're talking about it, we are now going to see light blue Honda Accords everywhere. As soon as I realized that I needed a new challenge and I needed partners and it's stuck in my brain that I needed it. There they were. Partners started showing up. Opportunities everywhere. We just don't have our filter open to see it. I'll prove it. That 2015 deployment to Turkey when I ran that field office in Western Turkey, it was on the Aegean Sea, but if you go a little bit further south, it's on the Mediterranean. I felt something kind of like France back in the day. 
right? I said, I'm going to live and work here. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm going to make it happen. In 2020, I was having a drink with a friend. She reminded me that our common friend's husband is Turkish Cypriot. He lives on the island of Cyprus. Oh. Immediately clicked to me that that was in the Mediterranean. And when she said he was a real estate developer, it yeah. took me three weeks to be on a Zoom call with him, three months to be in his living room in Cyprus. And we are on our fourth development project now on the island. Your brain has to be available for those opportunities. If you don't say you're going to do it, then when the opportunity presents itself, you won't even see it. So I'm just giving that example. You can do life in unique ways. If you say you're going to do it, opportunities present. So let me ask you a question too about investing, because when we talk about real estate investing, there's often a 100% focus on the bottom line, the dollars, the cash oh. flow, the cap rate, the cash on cash return. But what you're describing here is that unspoken, but very real side of real estate investing, which is that emotional piece. Because oh, I yeah. noticed you said that 36 unit that y'all bought, you still have. And mm -hmm. I'll wager at some point, somebody has come to you and said, hey, sell it to us, some hedge fund, whatever. Y'all like, no, nah, we're not, we're not in that we place yet. Because I feel like y'all probably love that property and these properties in Cyprus you've mentioned a couple of times that you see yourself in that trajectory toward the Mediterranean. So I'm guessing there's a little bit of emotion in those two. So talk to me about how you manage that balance between what you like and want and feel drawn to and the realities that the numbers do have to make some kind of sense. Because property is specific to a why. The original portfolio that I created from 2002 to 2015, I still own all of them. Oh, do you they're really? All, they're all paid off. And the question I get all the time is, why wouldn't you cash that? It's like two, two and a half million dollars worth of equity. Why wouldn't you cash that in and go buy some apartment complex with it and all that? You know why I won't? Because that secured my basic needs forever. That's I, I did that to secure my... So if everything goes to shit, I lose every single apartment complex I own. I still have 160 grand of passive income coming in. I would never sell them. It achieved the goal. Of course, I can make more money with that equity but it achieved the life related goal that I wanted with it. And with the Cypress stuff for the Mediterranean real estate, of course I'm going to make money, but it achieved the goal of me being a respected business person on the island. So when I show up, I'm not the American dude who just goes to the restaurant and eats. I'm actually the guy who's building property and trying to give back to the community. That was my why for that. But when I raise money from investors for my syndicating business, my why is to do good for them. So I have to look at bottom line. I have to look at interest rates and cap rates. How are we going to exit this property? How are we going to do a rate lock within this environment? It is a very different thing. So I have different pockets of real estate that support different goals. You have to think about it that way. Some are emotional, some are life related, some are investment related. But I, one, one last thing. When someone invests money in real estate, 100 grand, 50 grand, 300 grand, and you are the fiduciary of that money, it's not money. It's the year that they took of their life to earn it. It's very different. People look at money as some piece of paper that gets generated. That's bullshit. What it actually is, is the life energy that that mother, that father, that sister, or that brother put into it. When they missed all the soccer games, when they showed up late, when they had to feed their kid honey nut Cheerios instead of an apple or healthy food where they could make the meal all night or something like that. They created it. So you have to go invest that money well. So I have an emotional attachment from that because I'm not going to waste these people's life energy. We already talk about there's only a certain amount of time for us to be on this planet, right? There is some kind of emotional life person component to everything that we invest in. If people would look at it that way, that each thing serves a particular goal, I bet you people would invest better and actually live better. I feel like every realtor on the planet needs to hear that little mini sermon of yours right there because they get so lost in the dollars and the sales yeah. prices and the speed and they forget that that person came to you with their American dream and said, I've worked so hard and I'm ready now to do this. You've got to honor what brought them to the table. I freaking love this. That's like, <laughs> like ever. It's uh, true. It's true. It's true. If that's, not your, if that's not your keynote, you're missing a huge opportunity here, but to, to bring this, 
<laughs> do the stages of realtors and straighten them out because they kind of need this a lot. So I need you to do that, please. Uh, any anytime. Hey, you ever have an opportunity? Shooting my 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 radar is open. So I'm when, whenever you see something, you let me know. <laughs> Look, half of my viewers and listeners are involved in their real estate volunteer life, and all of them are like, oh. He's available. Is that Maurice or Mo? Let me write that down. <laughs> well, in, in all seriousness, if it helps people, if something like that helps people to get that perspective, I'll I'll do it. You pay for my travel, I'll show up. Because it's just like, what are we doing? What are we, what are people, do you really think you're gonna take this money to the grave? Do you but really want to wake up 72 years old and not have experienced all the experiences that you want? But, you know, look at the COVID era, right? So for three years now, we've had people who thought they could hide from a virus and, and somehow yeah. live forever. I mean, Howard Stern, right? Did you see this a couple of weeks ago? He, the first time he came outside in over two years, like he hasn't left his house because he's scared of COVID. And I'm like, you've got this much time left and that's how yeah, you spend it. That's tough. You're, you're that's not tough. going to live forever. We have to stop telling kids. <laughs> that they're going to live forever. I mean, life is this precious and wild gift, and we have no idea how long it lasts or what we get it's to do with it. We can't squander it. I, um, on that note, or just maybe to close out the note, I'll tell you one thing. I took, I, I want to give credit where credit's due. I took the Gary Vaynerchuk challenge, and I went to, like, I've responded to nursing homes and retirement homes as a police officer many, many, many times, but my mindset was different. I went back and I um, volunteered for two days because his point was go volunteer and go ask people what, the, you know, what was tough about life. So I did yeah. it for two, three days. You know, what was so impactful to me when I did it. Not one of those amazing people, moms of eight CEOs, pilots, not one talked about money or what they had. You know what they all talked about? What they didn't do. Yep. Regret. All of them. Because they don't have the physical ability or the money is gone. They don't have the time anymore. All of them were talking about the experiences they didn't have, the relationships they missed. I have zero fears in life. I told you I'll run into a burning building. I'll, I'll, bullets don't bother me. I've been around bombs. I've been to Somalia. I've been in the Mideast. I have zero fear except for one, regret. Mm -hmm. So do the business, do the real estate, push. And if you have a challenge, I have plenty. I've, I've had bad deals where I've just been like, oh, my God, I just destroyed myself. It's still worth it. You learn from it. Uh, you learn more from those and you learn mm -hmm. from the ones that are seamless. I mean, let's just be honest. You don't. How could you learn from something that's perfect? You can't. You can't. You, you got to have those failures to get to those successes. And even when you get to successes, you're like, all right, let's go do that again. It's the journey. It's not the money. Money is great. Don't get me wrong. I want it. I have goals. Money does things, but it, <laughs> oh, it moves the needle. Their right. Economic empowerment is very real. I have a very loud voice because I'm economically empowered. Right. Not because I'm a nice guy. But you can be a nice guy who's economically empowered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? that's true. Too. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. You got me on that one. Okay. So I think I could talk to you for like 47 hours and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface, but my <laughs> audience has no attention span. I honor that. How can people reach out to you if they want to learn about trying life on, they want to hear more yeah. about your story, what Quattro Capital does, what's the best way for them to find you? So a couple different ways. The first, first of all, I'm on pretty much every social media. Well, LinkedIn is where I'm very, very, very active. So just Maurice Philogene on LinkedIn. I'm constantly talking about life. Try Life On is my ode to lifestyle design. I have somehow lived four lifetimes in one lifetime. I know how to build lifestyles. You don't need a vacation from it has zero to do with money, everything to do with something I call the five freedoms I talk about on LinkedIn. If you go to trylifeon.com, it's talked about there as well. And I've been doing personal coaching there one-on-one. -on -one. I love helping people break the system. It is my joy to help people break the system. Find out why I turned down partner at my corporate firm four times for lifestyle. Um, Quattro Capital, we are an ad value investment firm. It's the Quattro Way, W-A-Y, the Quattro Way.com. And I think that's it. And everybody who reaches out to me on social media, one, oh, Instagram, sorry. All those travels, the 100 countries or so, and how I'm doing it, how I'm travel hacking, how I show up at an airport on a Wednesday without a ticket and end up in Istanbul the next day for free. I've been doing that shit forever. I went to the library and I studied it. 
you can go live unique ways. And I'm showing people visually on LinkedIn, on, on um, Instagram, how I do that. So any of those venues, and I just love talking to people. So if I can connect, it would be my honor. And I'll just point out, you said Istanbul, not Constantinople. Ah, can you get the yes. reference? Either, either one. I know. Uh, yes, I know the reference. Of That's a Gen X reference. And the Gen Xers, we are ignored. That's in the hilarious. World. Millennials, go look it up. Boomers, you are never going to bother. So You're just the, the Gen Xers, <laughs> high five. <laughs> right on, all right, all right, all right, on. I feel you. Hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm very grateful to spend a little time learning from you. And I'm super excited to connect further in the future. I appreciate you, Lee. Thank you. All right, guys, you learned something today. Say something nice about Maurice in the comments and make sure you come back and visit again. And we'll see you next time. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel. Turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you want to learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous. No judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.